everybody. Um, welcome from GPSA to this special recording of a webinar on psychedelic assisted therapy for mental illness. We've done this because psychedelic assisted therapy is likely to be coming and it's really about what you and your registrar need to know about it. Before we go any further, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. I'm not an Indigenous Australian. I was raised on the Gadigal land in Sydney, but now live in Wurundjeri land in Victoria. I would especially like to welcome and acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending. GPSA acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we work and live, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and future. We commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding and respect for the benefit of the broader community and future generations. Before we go any further, I would like to let you know about Dr. Jamie Rickord, who is doing the presentation. Jamie uh, has practiced medicine since graduating from the Imperial College of London in 2006. And for the past eight years, he's worked as a GP in the Northern Rivers of New South Wales. He's the founder of a specialised clinic in Byron Bay called Ananda Clinics. And uh, he has a specific interest in plant medicine and he's an experienced prescriber of medicinal cannabis. Uh, he's also studying a master's in trauma-informed psychotherapy. So thank you very much, Jamie and Mind Medicine Australia for bringing this presentation together. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Dr. Jamie, and um, I'm going to um, give you some information about these therapies and um, um, how we might start to do this. We're just going to play a short video first. Um, it's only a couple of minutes, so we'll play that now. Did you know that over 45% of Australians will experience mental illness in their lifetime? That's nearly half of us. I can't sleep. I don't know. Everything feels flat and grey. I feel ashamed. Mental ill health devastates lives and families and costs Australians around $60 billion a year. Research and treatment expenses continue to rise, yet rates of mental illness indicate that we're losing the battle. New approaches are urgently needed to address this immense suffering and cost. Psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is currently being trialled worldwide and has demonstrated remarkable promise in treating depression, anxiety, addiction and post-traumatic stress disorder with new trials underway for treatment of dementia and anorexia. The treatment combines a short program of psychotherapy with just a few medicinal doses of psilocybin or MDMA. In the 1950s and 60s, psychedelic treatments had a major impact in psychiatry and many considered it the next big thing in mental health treatment. But for political reasons, the Nixon administration criminalised the use of psychedelics and effectively stopped all research. That research has finally begun again. With proper clinical support, psychedelic treatments are safe and frequently lead to remission after only a short program and even where current treatments have failed. Here at Mind Medicine Australia, we believe everyone should have access to the best treatments for mental illness. Subject to forthcoming clinical trial results, we will seek to establish best practice in regulated psychedelic assisted treatment. Mind Medicine Australia is wholly focused on the clinical application of psychedelic medicines. We're preparing for change by developing therapist training, ethical guidelines, a centre of excellence in psychedelic medicine, educational material and events, and supporting clinical research. We're a small organisation doing big things, and we need your support. Please share this video and visit our website to support us and get involved. All right. Um, so that's a brief summary of what we're talking about. And um, we understand that for many people, this is a fairly challenging concept to get their head around, get your head around um, 
you know, it really is a massive shift in treatment paradigm. Um, and there is a lot of stigma and misunderstanding of these compounds and how they've been used throughout human history. So we'll clear some of that up tonight, talk about the science um, and um, yeah, hopefully satisfy some questions. So Mind Medicine um, is a charity uh, that's been set up by uh, Tanya De Jong and Peter Hunt um, to expedite change and bring these medicines into um, medical practice. Now, the reason for that is because of the enormous mental health problem affecting our society and one that actually is probably not probably is growing by the day especially in the sort of post covid world um, so we're going to talk about the mental the scale of the problem the purpose of mind medicine turning the tide with new breakthrough therapies um, the historical context of the use of psychedelic medicine um, the future potential and the strategy <laughs> So the scale, excuse me, the scale of the mental health problem. One in five Australian adults have a chronic mental health illness. One in eight are now on antidepressants with one in four older Australians. And that's gone up 20% in the last five years and nearly 100% in the last 15 years. And nearly half of us will experience mental illness in our lifetime. And this includes PTSD, anxiety disorders, depression, substance use disorders. The problem's enormous. A 100% increase in 15 years despite current treatments, antidepressants and therapy. Um, now, what's even more alarming is that these numbers are even worse for our veterans and first responders. Um, likely um, almost double that of the normal population. Um, and also amongst doctors, dentists, vets, farmers, there's an increased incidence of mental health problems. And I'm fairly sure that every single person watching this now or listening to this now has direct experience of a family member or a colleague who is suffering and is not getting any better with the current treatments. And that is why we are advocating for this and why I especially am very passionate about it, having spent 10 years as a GP, um, not what not not seeing people get better. There's a psychiatrist in the UK called Ben Sessa, who's really a you know a real pioneer of psychedelic therapies, and he is a very interesting perspective. And his question is, when did it become acceptable for doctors to palliate their patients, for psychiatrists to palliate their patients with a diagnosis they may have for the next 50 years? And when did it become unacceptable for us to say the word cure? Um, and I think if everyone ponders on that, that, that um, you know, you might find some interesting um, realizations in your own world 10 percent of first responders have ptsd one in three suffer from high psychological distress they have suicidal thoughts at two times the rate of adults in the general population and one first responder takes his or her own life every six weeks mental health is the last taboo in our society and we need to start talking about this and we need to recognize that what we're doing is inadequate and we need to find radical solution and we need to do that fairly rapidly before uh, more people lose their lives and more 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 suffering continues um it costs a fortune um adults with mental health illness are nearly twice as likely to be employed unemployed sorry um, there's a strong correlation between natural disasters and mental illness and if we now add covid to that you know australia's had a rough few years and there's a lot of people struggling um, it causes suicide and homelessness and the total cost of mental illness to and suicide to the australian economy is 220 billion dollars a year <clears throat> um, the the numbers are are striking and scary and um, again why I, I and my medicine are advocating for these changes there's been no improvement in treatment outcomes in the last 50 years um, with the depression 35 percent of sufferers experience remission from pharmacotherapy primarily antidepressants or psychotherapy um, 50 to 80 percent relapse after treatment stops 
and we all know that the side effects are enormous. Um, PTSD, only 20 to 30% of sufferers show some response to pharmacotherapy and only about 50% respond to any treatments. Remission rates are lower. So we need to change and we, we need to find new ways to do it. And um, the science behind what we're suggesting is there and it's a radical paradigm shift, but it needs to happen. Um, so m my medicine's purpose and the people involved, um, it's a charity that's been set up to alleviate suffering caused by mental illness in Australia through expanding treatment options available to medical practitioners and their patients. Um, and we're advocating for the safe and effective psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. As I mentioned, Tanya de Jong and Peter Hunt founded it. And the current focus is psilocybin for depression and um, medicinal MDMA for PTSD. Um, there are other molecules that are being used around the globe and being researched. Um, ketamine, ibogaine, uh, DMT. Um, we want them to become an integral part of our mental health system. We want high remission weight rates, if not cure. Um, and we want this to be accessible and affordable for all Australians. One question that gets commonly asked is what role do GPs have in this? Well, the first is awareness and understanding and the ability to um, have conversations with their, their patients about these medicines because the, the cat is out of the bag. Many people understand that these treatments are available. Many travel the globe to access them. Many access it illegally where there's no uh, quality control or safety. Um, and we're saying that we can drastically improve how this is being done. Um, the, the role of the GP, you know, psychiatrists on the whole will be the people assessing and um, prescribing these medicines. Possibly GPs will have a role in that in collaboration with psychiatrists. Medical practitioners will need to be involved in um, uh, overseeing the treatments and psychotherapists plus a second therapist or practitioner will be delivering the treatment. So there's roles for GPs to do applications, liaise with psychiatrists and be an assistant in the psychotherapeutic process, if not a psychotherapist themselves, if they have enough training. Um, and I think it's also at this point worth recognizing we need hundreds, if not thousands of people trained to do this, to start to make a dent. <laughs> And the reasons for that will become a bit obvious, a little bit, a bit more obvious a bit later. Um, this is the board. Um, there's a number of very well-known um, Australians on the board. Um, former trade minister, friend, minister, former trade minister for Australia, Andrew Robb, who has himself suffered with depression for 43 years. And he's well on board. And Chris Barry, the former head of the armed services, says these therapies are the only hope for thousands of veterans suffering with PTSD. And that is absolutely correct. Dr. Simon Longstaff, executive director of the Ethics Centre, says it's unethical for Australians who are suffering to not have access to these medicines in a medically controlled environment. Um, and again, we're going to reiterate that we are focused on therapeutic applications of these medicines by highly trained professionals. This is the management team, it's a small team, diverse skills, um, all very passionate about seeing change and all um, um, fascinating people. The ambassadors, these are some of the big names. I mentioned Ben Sessa earlier. Rick Dublin, who headed up, headed up, heads up MAPS. Um, he's, a, he's been advocating for the reintroduction of MDMA for psychotherapy since it was banned in the 1980s by the FDA. Um, and currently maps of over 3,000 participants through trials. Roland Griffiths is the head of the Psychedelic Center at Johns Hopkins, where they've mostly looked at psilocybin. Um, Professor Nutt, um, another mind from Imperial College in London. So these, are, on the whole, these are big institutions with very clever people who do not buy stigma. Um, and I think the real battle here is, is against stigma. Um, and I'm sure many of you watching will have your own stigmas and I'd advise you to observe that coming up as the science is presented to you. Lots of psychiatrists on the advisory panel um, all over Australia. 
There's a number of medical practitioners, um, GPs, physicians, emergency physicians, addiction specialists, um, and researchers, clinical psychologists, behavioral scientists, pharmacologists, religious practitioners, lawyers, and um, people involved in natural medicine and pharmaceutical industries, and many others. Um, it's a fascinating group of people that really, I think the thing that separates them from the rest of the population is that they do not allow stigma to color their view of science and understanding of how we can help people. Um, and the science is undeniable once you start to um, look at it. So turning the tide with new therapies, what does that actually look like? Well, we're talking about psilocybin medicine or psilocybin for depression, possibly OCD, addiction, anxiety, medicinal MDMA for PTSD and addiction. Patients who enter will have two to three dosed sessions. Um, as in a course of psychotherapy. So that might occur over about three months. A dosing session will last six to eight hours. Um, they'll be supported by two therapists, um, led by a psychotherapist, assisted by another practitioner, GP, psychiatrist. Um, psychiatrists will also lead if they're trained in psychotherapy, as can GPs if they're trained in psychotherapy. Psychotherapists with an assistant therapist, six to eight hours, helping people through um, a non-ordinary state of consciousness. Um, and then in between sessions is um, our psychotherapeutic session, standard psychotherapy to integrate. We say integrate the material that's come up. Um, these medicines are curative. They're very safe. There are There is no risk of harm and they're non-addictive. And patients do not take these home. These will not be given out in a pharmacy. They will be dosed in a controlled environment, medically supervised and held through that experience in the hope of changing thought patterns and behaviors and uh, reconnecting with their authentic self. Um, it's very complex. I'll talk some more about it in a minute. Um, but we are not also not advocating for the introduction of new pharmacology ecological agents these are old pharmacological agents that have already been proven to be effective psilocybin by thousands of years of use by humanity um, mdma was discovered in 1912 first formulated in 1912 and was banned in 1980 and prior to that 50,000 patients had access it in the in the u.s it was banned because of the war on drugs and again we'll get there this is a good slide it shows what i've just been talking about screening preparatory sessions dosing session integration sessions, dosing session, integration sessions, outcome six months. These will have, all the results have come from um, placebo controlled trials in the US, Israel, Canada, and the UK. Um, Australia has just started its first trial looking at end of life anxiety for psilocybin. There's plans for one for psilocybin for generalized anxiety, MDMA for substance abuse, um, and should these medicines be rescheduled to eight, there's going to be um, an explosion of research and interest in the field. Um, medicinal psilocybin, one to two active doses as per protocols, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, OCD, increased mental flexibility and sensitizes the patient to the therapeutic environment, um, provides a profound, per profound personal experience through dreamlike imagery and connected feeling. Um, and it's been proposed that integration occurs in a window after treatment. Uh, medicinal MDMA, medicinal MDMA, two, three doses, PTSD, treat underlying trauma, disarms a hyper-responsive nervous, nervous system, allowing a patient to safely approach trauma memories without becoming overwhelmed and therefore reprocess that memory and that event so that it can be concluded and they can move on. The memories are re-encoded without traumatic emotional connection integration supports the patient to process and move through the traumatic events and connect to the present moment um, they're very very safe psilocybin negligible physiological harm and toxicity with very low potential potential harm profile it's not addictive uh, proper clinical support and screening minimal psychological risks um, fear, panic, re traumatization, almost completely mitigated. A 2015 review found there to be no link between psychosis and psychedelic use. And that was a meta analysis that looked at thousands of dosing sessions. We're going to repeat that. There is no link between psychosis and psychedelic use. Medicinal MDMA, high, high doses, 
um, well in excess of therapeutic amounts may be neurotoxic, but a strong safety record in a medically controlled environment with clear protocols and is non-addictive. Over 3,000 participants using medically controlled doses in the MAPS studies looking at MDMA for PTSD. And there was one adverse event, and that was a tachycardia above a preset limit, and it was rapidly resolved. So you've got over 3,000 people who've been treated with MDMA for PTSD, and there has not been a single adverse event. And we have a 2015 review that showed that there's been no link between psychosis and psychedelic use. That is the science proving that the stigma is incorrect. Full stop. Anything else is stigma. These are compounds are safe when used in a medical environment. They have no potential for abuse. They are non-toxic and there are no adverse events. People get better. We'll move on to that. The next slide. This is an interesting slide before we move on to the actual science behind the psychedelics, looking at um, how harmful these substances are. This was first done in the UK by that fellow Professor Nutt. Um, and then repeated by the um, university, you know, but repeated by um, a Melbourne University. But this shows the blue is the harm to users and the red is harm to society. So ecstasy and LSD, psilocybin, magic mushrooms, they're right down at the end of the scale, you know, near carver and um, antipsychotic and number one, alcohol. So um, again, this is science proving that our drug laws are outdated. Irrespective of the drug laws, we're, we're not interested in that. We're interested in the medical use. So rescheduling to Schedule 8, the same as opiate medication, alprazolam, you know, drugs that need to be used with caution under medical supervision. Um, even outside of that, this graph shows that even on a societal basis, that these drugs are actually very safe. Um, patient testimonials. Um, um, trauma creates a prison in the mind, leaving countless Australians shackled by mental illness. I believe psychedelic therapy, responsibly administered in a safe and supported environment, is the key to unlocking those prison doors. In desperation, from a place of abject hopelessness, I turned to safe and supported ayahuasca psychedelic therapy. One week of intensive treatment provided transformational healing. I'm honored to be an example of what is possible with guided psychedelic therapy. And it is my passion to help my brothers and sisters in arms find their own healing journey. It's a, a veteran. A couple more quotes there. I felt like I went through 15 years of psychological therapy in one night. Now that's very common. Um, these medicines cut through the therapeutic process and save lives. They, they help um, clients establish rapport very quickly with their therapists, which saves time and reduces suffering. This can help prevent suicide due to a, due to a strong therapeutic alliance. Um, and I think back to the science, the science suggests that people do not overdose on these medicines in clinical settings and that um, although they may have a deep and transformational experience, unable to speak or move, for instance, participants have been recorded as being medically safe during this process, which is different from people self-medicating and using other drugs like opiates, which run a risk of overdose. And I would say, you know, as a group, GPs prescribe opiates on a daily basis. And, um, you know, I would say that a packet of endone poses more risk than significantly greater risk to our patients than um, one dose of a psychedelic in a, in a therapeutic environment. Um, so conclusion, these medicines are safe. You cannot overdose. Um, they might bring up difficult material and it might be a difficult process, but it will be worked through. And that's what the therapists are there there therefore um, and it's not like taking a packet of opioids home now this next slide this is the bare bones this is the stats this is what we're interested in now this is a um a slide that's looking at the the cohen's coefficient which is a measure of of effect size or treatment benefit 
Point two is small, point five is medium, point eight is large. The results from medicine assisted psychotherapy are off the charts. So psilocybin for depression is two to three point one. For end of life distress is point eight to one point six. So bigger than large. Psilocybin for alcoholism, one point two to one point four. LSD for end of life distress, one point one to one point two. MDMA for PTSD, one point one seven to one point two four. Probability of superiority is 80%. And just to put that in context, the antidepressants, SSRIs for depression, the coefficient is 0.3, so small. Um, you know, if you look at the, the, the NICE guidelines review that came out in 2009 and a number of meta-analysis looking at SSRIs, they've been shown to be no more effective than placebo in mild to moderate depression and marginally more effective than placebo in major depression. They also cause a, a medical condition that's in the DSM-5, which is a serotonin withdrawal syndrome. So they're not working and they're getting people sick. Um, what we're proposing is that one or two doses of a psychedelic medicine backed up by science, 80% probability of super, superiority, a Cohen's coefficient of 2.0 to 3.1 psilocybin for depression can turn these people's lives around. And that is simply hard science. Um, how does psilocybin work? This is fascinating. The pictures here are, are statistical remodelings of fMRI scans, functional MRIs that were done on people who were having a psychedelic experience. It's done at Imperial College um, and the Beckley Foundation did the maths. Now, the one on the left, the psilocybin, compared to the placebo on the right, shows increased brain connectivity. Um, so enabling patients to break out of repetitive and rigid styles of thinking, healing and behaving, and performing an active coping, restoring patient agency, allowing them to access their inner healer so they can move on from difficult material and find new solutions, um, connecting with their authentic self, seeing possibly wounds from their childhood or other aspects of their life that are holding them back and really having quite transformational experiences. Um, and this is what it looks like in an MRI scanner and then put onto a graph. There's a, there's a, there's a great book called how to change your mind. Um, um, and a chap called Michael Pollard um, or Pollen, one of the two. And he equates this change to skiing on a ski slope. So, when you're going down, um, you know, somewhere where it hasn't snowed for a long time, you're stuck in ruts and that's the only way you can get down the mountain. And then you have a fresh dump of powder and you can take any route down that mountain any way you like with any style and complete freedom. Um, and the analogy is that the psilocybin um, um, sort of increasing connection in the default mode network is a fresh dump of snow in a patient's mind. So they can see life differently. They can break out of patterns. And when with supportive psychotherapy can really make long lasting change um, without side effects or toxicity. Um, this is an another indication of how effective um, the therapies are. Um, you've got these bar graphs here. Um, the percentage of participants improved on measures of depression and anxiety five weeks and six months in the Johns Hopkins studies looking at psilocybin. Um, and you can see here that it's a massive shift, um, an enormous change. Um, and there was another study published at the end of last year um, where they compared two groups, the delayed treatment group and um, the current treatment group. And again, the results are astonishing. Eight, up to 80% of patients were in remission six months after the therapy. So another question that comes up a lot is the long-term efficacy of these treatments. Um, and we do need more data around that. But I would propose that if somebody needs an extra session after six months or a year, and they have a one-off dosing session of a non-toxic, completely safe drug that has no side effects that they don't take home, and then they go back into remission for a year, I would propose that that's still better than our current treatment options. How we deliver that needs to be looked into and needs to be worked out. Um, and again, this is all theoretical until we can actually access these medicines legally, hence the reschedule that was proposed to um, the TGA. 
Um, medicinal MDMA for psychotherapy, medicinal MDMA psychotherapy for PTSD, treating the cause. So MDMA is not ecstasy. Um, it's, it, it's, it's just not worth even thinking about it. An analogy I like to use, which is quite challenging to some people, if you go to the emergency department and you're given morphine for appendicitis or a broken femur, nobody will make a silly comment like you'll be shooting up heroin under the bridge next week. Morphine, diamorphine, so two morphines, it's heroin. And we don't use it in Australia, but in the UK, it's widely used in anesthesia and emergency medicine. We don't make any association with the use of heroin um, illegally when we give people um, morphine in emergency or indeed when we're prescribing opiates for pain in our practice. And this is the same medicinal MDMA used for psychotherapy, medicinal psilocybin used for psychotherapy in a treatment setting has nothing to do with what goes on illegally at festivals or on the street. Um, and comparing the two really shows a level of ignorance that can't be excused anymore. Um, so I think people need to bear that in mind and look at the science. Um, so the MDMA is also not therapy by itself, but a catalyst for the therapeutic process. Now in the MAPS phase one trials, it was healthy volunteers. They gave it to the therapists proved it was safe. Phase two trials, 105 participants, all the treatment resistant PTSD, average of 18 years, remission in 52% of cases immediately, and 68% of people at 12 month follow up. Um, now those results led to the FDA awarding MDMA breakthrough status, um, pending phase three trials, which are nearing completion. Over 3,000 patients, 3,500 across multiple sites in the US, Canada, and Israel have now been dosed. The interim analysis would leave a 90% or greater probability there will be statistically significant results when all participants have been treated. And therefore, it's very likely that MDMA will be prescribable in the US in the next 18 months as a course of psychotherapy. How does it work? It decreases fear and defensiveness while increasing empathy, trust, and safety. It decreases the activity of the amygdala associated with traumatic memory. It allows people to connect to a deeper part of themselves and to a, the therapists in the room and resolve patterns they have been stuck in for years. And I really want to reiterate that it has nothing to do with taking tablets at raves or at festivals and comparing the two i'm going to reiterate this really shows a level of misunderstanding and ignorance around these medicines that cannot really be excused anymore so the results are building momentum there's going to be some trials in australia next year which i've talked about um, imperial college is looking at anorexia johns hopkins is looking at early stage dementia ocd with maps um, alcohol addiction again at imperial um, the regulatory schemes in the US expanded access, Australia with the special access and Israel compassionate use, potentially enable physicians to apply to the regulator for approval to treat patients suffering from treatment resistant PTSD with medicinal MDMA, psilocybin psychotherapy for depression outside of a clinical trial. And Switzerland has a similar scheme which is allowing LSD, psilocybin and MDMA to be used. I think what's worth noting is that Australia has so far not done any research into this whatsoever. We are well behind the eight ball um, and we need to catch up because we have a lot of people. We've been through a lot in the last two or three years in this country um, and there are a lot of people out there, droughts, fires, COVID, who are really suffering first line responders and this is the way to help them. Um, the US has decriminalized psilocybin in a number of places. Um, and in fact, um, Portland's now legalized it for therapy, Oregon. Um, the Canadian government is allowing more and more people to access it. And the German government has approved phase 2B study on psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. Um, so the key questions for Australia are timeliness, availability, and access. Um, and it needs to happen slowly and carefully, and we need to build experience and training. Um, but with all of that, there'll be a big shift. This chart slide shows who's involved. And these are, um, these are not insignificant institutions. Um, and the people in them are looking at the science. They do not allow stigma to outweigh science. And I think that I can't hammer that message home enough. 
um, it's stigma that's preventing us from using these medicines and it's stigma that's preventing people from getting better. Um, centers of excellence around the world, Imperial College, Berkeley, Johns Hopkins, uh, Compass in the US and Mount Sinai as well. And Mind Medicine hopefully will be setting up one in Australia. Quick slide really about medicinal psychedelics through history. So the Eleusian mysteries, which um, um, attended by Plato, Aristotle and Cicero, uh, where they drank kaikion, which was a psychedelic drink. Um, and some of the great mysteries were solved in, in, in Eleusius. Um, 1912, Merck developed MDMA to use psychotherapy and that went up to the late 70s, 80s. Sandos, Albert Hoffman, many of you will have heard of him. Um, he first synthesized LSD and he synthesized psilocybin, um, which really <coughs> opened the door for psychiatric interest. 50s and 60s, over 40,000 patients took part in therapeutic psychedelic sessions. They were considered the next big, big thing. Dr. Stan Groff, who's a psychiatrist and pioneering psychedelic researcher who invented holotropic Breathwork is a way to access non-ordinary states of consciousness when these drugs were banned. Has said that psychedelics used responsibly and with proper caution would be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology and medicine or the telescope is for astronomy. Um, 2020 trials, Canadian government have allowed compassionate access. Um, the war on drugs, um, which Professor Nutt, who I've mentioned a couple of times, has said this is the worst censorship of research and medical treatment in the history of humanity. And when you look at the science, it is. Um, the Nixon presidency had two enemies. This is a quote from a Nixon aide. The anti-war left and black people. You, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against, couldn't, couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war on blacks, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalization, criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So it was criminalized in the 70s, MDMA criminalized in the 80s, and ever since nothing's happened, now something's happening. This is a graph that shows you know, the peak of research in the 70s, beginning of the war on drugs, and it dropped off. And now in 2021, we're we're really getting back to what happened in the 70s. So currently there's 56 trials for MDMA, 37 for psilocybin, 11 for LSD, four for Ibogaine, four for salvinorium, and one for ayahuasca or DMT. Um, this slide really just indicates the kind of biz business side of it, which I expect that most of you watching, much like me, don't really have a lot of interest in, but it is going to be a multi-billion dollar industry um, and people are going to move into it. Um, there is going to be big bucks thrown at it and that really serves us by proving that it works and allowing patients access so they can get better. Um, the strategy of mind medicine is really awareness and knowledge building, education events, free webinars, you know, talking, talking like this. Um, there's a major summit in November 2021 in Melbourne, which is well worth attending. Um, ongoing advocation for research. And we have state and regional chapters that anyone can can combine this one local to me there's the gold coast they're all over um the therapist training has started which i'm part of the first cohort so this year 100 therapists will be trained and that's going to be gps psychiatrists social workers psychologists psychotherapists mental health nurses all going through the training so that we are ready to start offering these treatments when the time comes and like i said more research is is Research is beginning in Australia, and I think an important message that all of us want to get across is that research will continue. We won't be doing this willy-nilly in clinics. We will be part of real-world evidence, gathering real-world evidence, observational trials, to continue to push the agenda forward that this is safe um, and to further find out who it can help with. And uh, an Asia-Pacific Centre for Emerging Mental Health Therapies is in the pipeline. Um, um, and really, all of this is to build awareness, knowledge, people who are trained to do it, um, legal and ethical frameworks, support services, um, and rolling it out. And the focus 
for, for, for clarity is wholly clinical. 45% of Australians will experience serial men, serious mental illness in their lifetime. And what are we going to do about it? And really that's what this slide is about. The way everyone can help is to start conversations, look at the science, break down the stigma, join chapters, look at the training for GPs. It's a wonderful course and very, very interesting. Um, talk to um, your colleagues, to psychiatrists, and that's a question that's come up a lot. How do GPs talk to psychiatrists? How do we access it? Slowly, basically, the psychiatrists are suspicious. A lot of people are suspicious. So we just need to carefully change the story. Um, and if people are interested, they can contact My Medicine, do the training, um, and slowly but surely we'll move towards a place where these medicines are available for our patients who really who really need it. Um, the, the summit I've mentioned, the therapies begun, the training therapies have begun. Um, um, we want to support research. Uh, we want to do events to build awareness, um, building frameworks, center of excellence. This is the certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. And I would recommend contacting Dr. Alana Roy at My Medicine if you're interested in training in it. It's a fantastic course. Um, I'm, I've started it. It's fascinating. Um, there's psychological support services through My Medicine. So there are a number of psychotherapists, psychologists who are plant medicine aware, um, who can help support people and um, um, talk to people if they are accessing these medicines illegally and need some help. Um, there is a whole support network building in Australia um, because this is happening and you are going to be asked about it. Um, and I suspect more and more and more in the coming years as global awareness builds for how, how um, effective these medicines can be. Um, so the, the next decision is announced, well, it would have been announced by the time many of you hear this. Um, it's an interim decision. If we get a full reschedule, then um, we hope research and clinical use can start with earnest. Um, this is again another slide about the summit. Um, there's lots of events that My Medicine have organised, and I would encourage everyone to look at their website. Um, there were some some questions. So, are there trials anywhere in Australia? Yes, in Melbourne, one started at St Vincent's End of Life Anxiety. Um, uh, there's another one starting in Melbourne this year. It's recruiting for generalized anxiety disorder, psilocybin, MDMA for substance abuse. And there's one in WA, but a very small one. We hope the reschedule will allow much more research to begin. What will be the role of GPs in delivering this therapy? Um, the GPs will have a role in referring to psychiatrists, obtaining approvals with psychiatrists. And if you think that a therapy session requires two people in the room and a doctor to oversee it, um, there's massive scope for GPs to be involved, um, both as lead therapists, if trained as a psychotherapist or assistant therapist or medical supervision. Um, you know, these are not going to be um, one dose, one hour. It's a lengthy process and we're going to need lots of people trained and lots of facilities open. Will it be expensive? Um, well, it, you know, the most expensive cost is going to be the therapists and um, the doctors. Um, you know, if someone can be in remission and um, back with their families and living their life for for a cost of maybe fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, I think to say that's too expensive. Um, I don't think it is. But again, this all needs to be worked out. Um, one question: People currently seek their own therapy, particularly with psilocybin and DMT, with a shaman type therapist. Any data on whether these are largely harmful or helpful? No. There's no data. It's not being done in research. We're talking about medical use based on science and extensive research. Um, and that has shown that it's been extremely effective. Anecdotally, humans have been using these, these compounds for millennia to treat their mental health problems. Um, and people still will travel to the Amazon basin to have ayahuasca or um, so if you speak to them, a lot of the people that have had to access it illegally will report that it's been completely life-changing for them. Um, the problem is there are a lot of people who aren't trained to do it and we don't know what their medicine is. And really that's what we're advocating for, doing this in a controlled environment with um, medical grade uh, psilocybin MDMA with highly trained therapists. Um, 
that's what we're talking about. Um, are Australian psychiatrists generally supportive of these new treatments? The College of Psychiatrists is um, not said no, they've not said yes. There's a number of psychiatrists who are very supportive. Some of them are, you know, um, really on board. Many are not. It's a, it's a paradigm shift, it, you know, to the way these medicines work and the therapy involves sort of starts to ask questions of how we have been treating mental health. And there's a lot of people who will find that quite challenging. Um, change is challenging. Um, so there'll be a number of psychiatrists that, that won't be interested. There'll be a number of GPs who won't be interested. Um, and that's fine, that's humans. Um, we just need to find the ones that are and then we can begin doing it. Will it be expensive? We initially, yes. Um, we hope in time that you know DVA will come on board, insurance will come on board, um, and there'll be other ways to deliver the therapy group settings, um, et cetera, et cetera. More complex cases, more highly trained staff, less complex cases, less highly trained staff. Um, you know, much like any other medical situation, you know, you don't have the registrar doing open heart surgery. Um, so the very complex cases will be much more senior therapists and psychiatrists and perhaps um, slightly more straightforward cases will be done by less experienced therapists. Um, you know, this is the medical model and this is what we want to bring into it. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please contact us at Mind Medicine or contact me directly. Um, and um, have a lovely day. In closing this recording, I'd like us to acknowledge that GPSA is supported by funding from the Australian Government under the Australian General Practice Training Program. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation. Mm -hmm.